Hi, um, welcome everyone uh, to the last day of the Southeast Asia Breast Cancer Symposium 2022 being held here in Manila, Philippines. Are you with us for the next session, which is going to be talking about uh, knowledge into action, national control, uh, can cancer control plans. And uh, let me tell you that when we look at the issue of, nan uh, of national cancer control plans, we see the role and importance of these instruments uh, throughout the years growing from strength to strength, but also in terms of importance, in terms of guiding the uh, national response to yeah, cancer. And so there are many questions when it comes to these na national cancer control plans and whether uh, governments have them or not, and many countries have, uh, whether or not they're funded, a very important question, and whether or not top-down approaches actually work. And one increasing question, especially when we are taking on uh, patient-centered approaches, whether patients themselves are involved in the development of these national cancer control plans. So with that, we have quite a very interesting panel of uh, speakers who will be speaking to the issue. But before I introduce uh, our speakers to you, I would like to just introduce you very briefly to our reactor who will be joining us here uh, to respond later on to the uh, discussion, and, and that is Dr. Carlito Cairo, who is a medical officer and program manager at the Department of Health. Welcome, Dr. Cairo. So uh, we have with us, as I mentioned, uh, quite an a, a excellent group of speakers to talk to us on this issue, and I would like to just introduce our first speaker, uh, Leslie Given, who will help to introduce the issue of uh, national cancer control plans and she is a public health consultant uh, and co-owner of strategic health concepts a public health consulting company so without further ado i hand it over to you leslie go ahead and it's good to be with you today um, i appreciate the invitation and um, we'll get started so thank you um, my first slide please so um, I, my job, as, as you heard, is to um, give you a little bit of background about what national cancer control plans are and why they're important and why you should care as an advocate. So um, I want to share just a, just a few things with you um, about what is the plan and um, how partners fit into this role, how advocates fit into it. Um, so a, a national cancer control plan is simply a, a strategy. It's a written document. It's a blueprint for action to address the burden of cancer in a country, taking into account that country's context, cultural norms, healthcare systems, and resources. And typically, it's a plan that is written to cover five to 10 years. Next slide. Um, these plans are really focused on population health and they address the whole continuum of care. So they're not just about prevention or just about um, early diagnosis. They're about all the way from um, reducing risk through incre increasing quality of life for both cancer patients, their families, but also communities. Next slide. And um, the plans are meant to be comprehensive and systematic. And so this slide shows you that the plans cover the continuum, as I mentioned, from prevention through palliative care, survivorship. And each um, part of that plan should have broad goals, measurable objectives, and evidence-based strategies that are supported by data, that address health inequities, that include a research aspect, that are evidence-based, um, and also that are underpinned by a process of evaluation and monitoring. And most importantly, are, part, are supported by partners. Without partners, the plans wouldn't exist, and without partners, they wouldn't be implemented. So those, the, the partners um, that help develop and implement the plans are critical. Next slide, please. And these, these are important, as was mentioned in the introduction. Um, in 2017, there was a UN declaration. Um, that declaration really does bolster the importance of a national cancer control plan and it helps to solidify the need 
for a comprehensive and a systematic approach to cancer in all countries. And the declaration acknowledged the role of these national cancer control plans um, as part of that, of that systematic approach. Next slide. So um, the promise of a comprehensive approach to cancer control is reflected in this slide. And it's not just about the plan. Hopefully it's also about the process of partners to got, coming together. And we really do um, see and try to work with countries through the International Cancer Control Partnership um, to help them understand that it's not necessarily a top-down um, plan from the government. It's really built from the community up and um, includes all different types of stakeholders. The benefits can be great. There can be um, increased support, financial, political will can be bolstered, um, leveraging partners and maximizing the resources that they bring together already to the cancer problem is an important um, benefit of implementing a national cancer plan. Um, increased use of research and evidence uh, to development of evidence, even to guide efforts is part of a, a benefit of a cancer plan. And one of the most important things that we see in countries is um, ensuring accountability. So a plan lays out a system for accountability. A lot of plans have built into them an implementation process with timeframes and who is responsible. Um, and so accountability is a big, a big uh, benefit of a national cancer plan. The other benefit is that it can convey what all the needs are in a country uh, around cancer control. It's written, it's shared. Um, there can be uh, a um, executive summary of the cancer plan that, are sh that is shared with um, policymakers. And so it is a communication tool as well. And of course, the overall intention is to improve health for all people. Next slide. So um, of course, the plan is just a document and it takes people, it takes partners to make it come to life. And so this slide is from a report from WHO. Um, and it, it, because cancer is a complex solution, it requires a whole of society approach. So multi-sector partnerships are critical. They're part of um, implementation of a cancer plan and that includes advocates um, and survivors uh, are all part of the mix, bringing different strengths, different perspectives, but it's also all parts of the government um, and communities need to be involved. The challenge is big, so we need lots of, lots of help, lots of partners at the table. Next slide. So this is also from that WHO report on cancer, and I, we, we brought it to you to show you that there are a lot of opportunities for involvement. There, there are different phases of a national cancer control plan. So there's uh, a phase that is very much planning. There's an opportunity for community um, and advocacy involvement there. Implementing the plan obviously takes all of, all of the multi um, sector partners at the table. There's also ongoing evaluation and then updating the plan. So it's a cycle. Um, so once you, you set priorities, you form a plan, you um, figure out how to cost the plan and how to implement it, hopefully how to garner the resources that are needed. You implement the plan, you monitor and evaluate and then you choose new priorities, you set a new plan and you continue to implement the plan. So advocates can be involved in every step um, and really stakeholders are at the center of national cancer control planning. Next slide. So I wanna switch gears just a little bit before I pass it on to Lisa to talk more um, about some examples and roles for advocates in breast cancer. Um, through national cancer control plans. I want to tell you about the International Cancer Control Partnership, if you don't know about it, the IECCP. It was formed in 2012, and it includes 25 plus partners um, from ASCO to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, National Cancer Institute, 
many cancer centers and academic institutions, um, and also um, NGOs like UICC and the American Cancer Society, but also regional experts um, from the Pacific, Latin America, and other regions. Um, one of our newest partners is uh, Global Focus on Cancer, which many of you, I'm sure, know Carolyn Taylor. Um, so uh, Global Focus on Cancer is a new partner. Then the other thing that's important about ICCP to note is that we work in tandem with UN agencies like WHO, IARC, and IAEA, which is why Lisa is here with us today. So the mission of uh, the vision of the International Cancer Control Partnership is that, is that all countries have and are implementing a resource, people-centered national cancer control plan. And our, our mission, the way we do this, is um, to provide leadership, expertise, and guidance to national cancer control stakeholders and decision makers, and hopefully um, influence uh, policymakers to understand that that having a national cancer control plan is important. And the last slide that I have to share with you, I'm sorry, a couple more slides, there we go, is um, just a little bit more about what the ICCP offers. Um, we do offer technical assistance in developing a national cancer plan and um, advising about how to implement that plan. Um, the national, uh, we do review national cancer control plans and provide feedback. Um, and we also um, have a, an ECHO program that we um, have had going on now for a couple of years for countries who have a national cancer control plan. Um, and so that is something that you can find more information about on our portal. Um, which the, uh, the website is there at the bottom of the slide. The portal has a wealth of information, different types of resources, not just about plan development and implementation, but also about key issues um, and uh, resources for different types of cancers, um, uh, treatment, different, different aspects of cancer control. And the other thing that we offer, of course, is connection with national cancer control partners and experts around the world. So with that, I am pleased to turn it over to my friend Lisa Stevens from the IAEA. Lisa. Uh, before that, uh, let me just introduce um, Lisa Stevens to all of you. Lisa uh, joins us from the um, the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, and she is the Director, uh, Division of uh, Program of Action for Cancer Therapy, or uh, PACT. And uh, she will be talking about uh, opportunities for advocacy and, and certainly for there to be engagement, and some of which has been touched on by uh, Leslie earlier, and we are hoping to expand on that further in this part of the presentation. But before we go into that, let me just remind all of our viewers and participants in today's uh, session to make use of the chat box uh, to ask your questions and be able to post them because they are going to be uh, parts of this discussion that we're going to go in depth into uh, some of what was discussed. So please do uh, share your questions on the online chat. So without further ado, I hand it over to you, Lisa. Go ahead. And I'll just ask if uh, my slides can be projected. Um, I want to thank Leslie for the introduction. And um, I'm going to synchronize my presentation to what she said, but uh, not overlap too much. So please go to the next slide. Um, Leslie talked about the strategic, the strategic approach through the National Cancer Control Plan. And the, and the process of planning. And really, we want to look at various components across the entire health system. So I, I have repeated the cancer control continuum at the bottom of the slide, but I want to point to box number three and um, the, the stock taking exercise or the assessment, the evidence base that can be provided from across the cancer continuum in order to have a very strong cancer control plan. And this is really one of the reasons why, as IAEA, I am here today and why I'm involved in the um, International Cancer Control Partnership is because we do have a very strong uh, relationship across the UN 
and can respond to member states' requests for these initial baseline assessments. So what is the current status of the cancer capacity, the care delivery system in a country? And so we work very closely. We also work, as Leslie mentioned, with, with advocates. They are a part of this assessment and they are a part of the development of a national cancer control plan and also the implementation. So in that in box number four there, it's really, we've got to include not only representatives from the various aspects of the cancer control continuum, but also various aspects of the community. Next slide. So I'll go around the, the, the circle of these basic principles. And, and also just to flag, Leslie mentioned some WHO uh, tools for national cancer control plans. There are checklists that can help in this process. The ICCP does have a wealth of resources, but key within some of these points. And if, if I start, I'll start with stakeholder engagement because I think that's really key for the audience today. We need um, to ensure that again, across the continuum, there are representatives, but that there are also representatives from uh, patient advocates from, from various um, community groups, non-governmental organizations who will, will be part of this process because that really strength, strengthens the process. There needs to be this coalition of partners. And, and Leslie and I have had many conversations on partnership over the years. And it's really, what can a partner bring to the table that's, that's um, contributing to this process? It doesn't mean that every, you know, every aspect of of one organization's um, priorities are, are all consuming within this, but it's a it's an overlap. It's a it's a synergy in the um, in the partnership needed to support the cancer control effort. Um, you definitely need to look at the needs of the population and respond to those needs within this cancer control process. Um, again, in terms of evidence based decision making, use the results of these um, impact assessments that I mentioned on the previous slide use that evidence base to understand the gap areas and what needs to be um, enhanced through the process of planning. Um, look across the entire system. Again, we talk all the time about the cancer control continuum. So even though IAEA as a technical agency looks at nuclear medicine, radiotherapy, our partners like WHO look at other aspects of the cancer continuum. So again, in partnership with ministries of health, with um, non-governmental organizations or civil society organizations, we can look across and be comprehensive in this approach. We also wanna look at uh, monitoring and evaluation so that uh, progress can be tracked. And if, if there's an area where progress is not being made, that again, together with this coalition of partners, those, uh, those areas that might be lagging behind can be addressed. And finally, going back up to the top of the circle is leadership. And um, leadership is key to be identified because if there's not someone leading this process, then um, it's, uh, it's harder to make any progress. And, and so um, we, uh, again, in looking at these partnerships, there are different types of resources that can be brought to the table. Um, it's not always money because time is a huge resource. And, and that's where I think um, advocacy groups patient groups can bring their, their time to the table and also help in that monitoring evaluation and accountability. So I think there are, again, many opportunities and many roles for, for advocates. Next slide. I have an example here um, from Kazakhstan and it um, allows me to flag that actually tomorrow, a paper will be published on the evolution of this joint partnership across the UN agencies on the impact reviews. And in that paper, we do have some case studies from different countries. And Kazakhstan is one of the um, case studies. So while this quote card and this example is, is focused really on the impact review and the, um, the changes that were made within Kazakhstan, I, um, I, I can't not highlight the fact that the impact review led to changes that were reflected in the National Cancer Control Plan. And their plan, again, has five pillars that go across, go across the cancer um, care continuum, prevention, early diagnosis, 
integrated care, workforce development and research. And I know there was a the previous session focused on research and these really are framed by the expert um, recommendations from the impact review. Next slide. And this figure is from an IAEA publication that demonstrates again, the need to look at various aspects of the cancer control continuum. And in the bottom right corner, it's looking at this also as a slice through the health system. So there's parts of the health system that deal with prevention, parts of the health system that deal with um, treatment. So it's, it's really a, a representation of the various considerations and the various filters through which the planning process um, can, um, can occur. And there are policies that need to be put into place that again, these can be supported by advocates and survivors. For example, advocates can be a strong voice in terms of looking at the workforce and areas that need to be improved, perhaps patient navigation. Um, advocates have played a key role in countries like Brazil in terms of having the time from diagnosis to treatment put into law. And so there are, there are ways in engaging in the governmental process of national cancer control planning where advocates can really have a strong voice. Another example from the uh, Lancet Oncology paper that I mentioned is that in Senegal, the Ministry of Health used the impact review to map stakeholders and to determine how to include childhood cancer in the development of their national cancer control plan. So throughout the, the examples that I've given, I've been focusing on the continuum as a whole, but then understand that there are specific cancers. And I know this is the um, is focused on breast cancer here, but there are various ways to bring in disease specific um, focus into the planning process. Next slide. So also in the, the Lancet Oncology paper, we highlight the example from Sri Lanka. And through the process of their impact review, they realized that they wanted to have a specific plan to expand radiotherapy. And again, that's a, a technical area that the agency um, focuses on. But they've also formed the National Advisory Committee. And this National Advisory Committee for Cancer has government organizations, non-governmental organizations, so the NGOs, community-based organizations. There are UN entities as part of this uh, committee and professional colleges. And I, and I wanted to highlight this because again, it's an example of this multi-sectoral approach, different partners bringing their strengths and their perspectives to this overall planning process. So on the next slide, I just thank you again for your attention. Um, there are ways to contact us and, and to follow our work. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Lisa, for sharing your insights and uh, IEA's perspective with regards to uh, national cancer control plans. And I actually have quite a few questions for you as well, and I do hope <laughs> you'll be able to uh, uh, answer them in a short while. But uh, before we go into that, we now have our final presentation. And we've heard quite a lot about the Philippines' experience concerning um, uh, responding to cancers through institutional methods. And We've heard quite a lot about the uh, National Integrated Cancer Control Act, a piece of legislation that's vital here in this country in responding to cancer. So with us, we're very fortunate to have to share his own role um, in that whole effort. It's Peter Paul Perez, who is the president of uh, Cancer Coalition Philippines. And he actually was one of the moving forces behind the passage of that a critical piece of legislation. So without further ado, I hand it over to you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Azrul. Uh, it's such a great honor to be sharing our experience uh, as far as the passage of the National Integrated Cancer Control Act is concerned. So may I have my slides, please? Okay, so um, let's move on to the next one. Next one, please. Okay, so I just want to put in context on um, why this is quite important for everyone. So for so many years, um, as a matter of fact, what I've stated there is 2007, 
um, there were multiple leg um, attempts to really pass a cancer control program uh, via a legislation in the Philippines. And from what I've counted, there were 62. Uh, though yesterday I've heard another speaker, Dr. Ngilangel, saying it's over 30 years of work. Uh, so but the bottom line is there were so many attempts in the past, and none has really passed uh, uh, the second reading of Congress. But in 2017, a small group of committed individuals got together and thought, you know, this has to stop and we have to do something about it. Um, and the whole idea is to really try to change the narrative of cancer uh, in the Philippines. And um, we put come, we come together to form a coalition. And uh, the first project, obviously, is to push for a legislation. And uh, we're blessed with the fact that by February 14, two years after, then President uh, Rodrigo Duterte um, signed it into law. And a few months after, uh, universal health care law was also passed. So in tandem, uh, they've become strong pillars in terms of the new healthcare system in the Philippines. Next slide, please. Um, so I think if there's one, you know, a lot of people are asking me what was it like, and uh, this is just like one simple, you know, uh, definite uh, or, or encapsulates exactly what we've done. Uh, it was really a, a ride like no other. Next slide, please. Um, in putting together this presentation, you know, this quote actually is something that resonated for, uh, with me. Experience is the best teacher and the worst experiences teach the best lessons. So allow me to share a few uh, lessons that we've learned uh, as far as the coalition is concerned in terms of pushing for this advocacy work. Okay. Next slide, please. So the first one is Ask for the Moon. Um, we've heard the two speakers earlier about uh, Cancer Continuum, and we did exactly that. We did the exercise of really going to the Cancer Continuum and trying to figure out exactly what we wanted uh, to ask. And in, th in that process, we agreed that uh, as a coalition, we will all fight for all cancers, all ages and all stages, and that became our bare minimum. So the, the first version of the, of the bill actually was extremely comprehensive, extremely national in coverage, and is extremely integrated. And the reason why we pushed for that one is because we know at one point, you know, uh, even if you ask for the moon, they'll just give you the stars. Okay? And, but then, you know, when you get to that point, you know that your bare minimums are covered, and the fight you know, for cancer patients will still be very strong. So the first point that I want to share with everyone is that the whole idea that, you know, when you put together the first version, put everything as much as possible, be as comprehensive as you can be. Next slide, please. The second aspect is learn the bureaucracy. You know, none of us actually work with government when we started this, but we had to really embrace it. We had sessions in terms of how the law should be passed. We had sessions in terms of how policies are made. Uh, we had sessions in terms of how to actually utilize national budgets. Uh, we reach out to DBM, we reach out to, to the finance department of the government. We even reach out to the National Ed uh, Economic Development Authority because it was all part of the journey of really finding out exactly how these things work. A lot of people will tell you it will not pass. A lot of people will say, you know, um, this will never fly, but th you should not let this stop you. Because if you start learning how the bureaucracy works, you'll be able to navigate through it. And in that navigation, you'll be able to find ways and means to really push forward with your advocacy. And that's exactly what we've done. And in that whole exercise, we were able to find gaps, so to speak. And we use those gaps as an opportunity for us to really push for other provisions, uh, which now have become part of our, or pillar of the, of the law. Next slide, please. Um, the third one is cast the net far and wide. You know, really, you need to network, network, network. Um, there are some politicians that we've never talked before. We have to talk to them all of a sudden. Um, they wanted photos. Fine, we'll take photos with you. Uh, but the whole idea is to really, you know, um, reach out to as many people. You know, even if you don't know them, you know, a simple text, a simple uh, tweet, for example, tagging them will be a start of a conversation. This is exactly what happened to us. You know? Uh, and we have to keep on reminding ourselves the fight is bigger than you. So put away personalities, put away whatever issues you've got, because the fight is far bigger than anyone. So the whole idea is to really work with anyone, regardless of what the political color or whatever um, you know uh, beliefs that they've got. You know? um, and I think uh, even for example, um, the whole idea of who do we work with? Uh, do we work with the industry or not? Um, and do we work with this particular? Uh, groups or not. Um, 
And uh, the consensus of the coalition is everyone has an equal voice in, and a seat on the table. That's the reason why we reach out to everyone. Okay? Um, and of course, you know, one, one key point though that we have to keep on reminding ourselves is yes, as much as we network with everyone, as much as we're open to working with anyone, we need to remind ourselves there should be no strings attached. Uh, because mind you, oh, af after the, the law was passed, there were people who were trying to collect, so to speak, <laughs> some sort of, uh, some sort of, you know, uh, uh, can you do something for me now because I did something for you before. Uh, that type of conversation, of course, it's a very uncomfortable conversation. But again, if you put your 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 feet on uh, on on the ground, firmly on the ground, and say, you know, we don't do these things, then they'll they'll understand. Um, but the whole idea is to really spread your wings far and wide uh, to talk to as many people as possible. Next slide, please. And the fight never stops. No. Um, you know, after the passage of the law, we all agreed to the fact that, um, you know, this is it. Uh, we were successful. We were, we were able to make it happen. But later on, we realized, oh, there's an IRR session that we have to attend to. And after the IRR session, now we're monitoring its implementation. So apparently, the fight never stops. No? And, and you win some, you lose some, but soldier on. Uh, well, I think uh, we have to be very focused on the fact that as long as the cancer patients in the country are not yet fully serviced or not yet enjoying the benefits of the full extent and the spirit of the law, then the fight continues. You know? A lot of times, we feel like um, there are things that we should have done better. Uh, and uh, that is all a great reminder for us to soldier on um, because uh, in the cancer and all its uh, and everything about it is an evolving process and, and you, have to be, uh, you have to keep updating yourselves in terms of what are the trends and what are the things that you have to do. Uh, connecting with international groups as well uh, would allow you to really push forward uh, advocacy further. And as such, you, know, you have to embrace that idea that, that the, the fight never stops. And the last one that I want to share, which I think is the most important slide of all, is uh, next slide, please. Patient's voice is powerful. You know, um, we've heard it so many times all throughout these three days. You know that you have to put the the a real face behind the story or share real stories, and that this is so true as well in terms of our experience in passing Nika. But I just have to put across as well a warning that you know. Um, there are two roles of the patients, aside from really sharing their story, they are also part of the solution. Mind you, in all of our discussions, in all of our consultations, uh, patients actually put across very solid proposals. Um, and we were able to really take that, uh, that down and, and put that as a part of, uh, of the law. And the other aspect is that as much as they get a lot of attention, the, the patients, we should not abuse as well. Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, in this media or social media crazy country, uh, sometimes uh, they would actually tweak the story just to uh, push uh, you know, uh, some item forward. Um, I do remember like uh, towards Christmas, I, I got a call from, from some groups saying, um, can we take a photo with some of the patients? And so we did share with, with them some of the patients and they were surprised that they look like anyone in this room. And they said, no, 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 no. we want someone you know, who's really sick, bald, and all those things. So they have those preset notion of what a patient should be. And we said no, because, you know, cancer is not a death sentence. Cancer is, uh, is something that we can fight, and a lot of people are surv uh, have survived it already. And, and as such, you need to know exactly, you know, how to project the patient's voice as well. So those are just some of the five quick tips uh, as rule, and I hope uh, I was able to really uh, cascade some key lessons uh, to our viewers today. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, and, and certainly uh, thank you for reminding us about the, the importance and the significance of having patients involved in the process of developing National Cancer Control Program. We'll, go, we'll come back to that uh, shortly. So we have with us Dr. Cairo as a reactor to uh, the discussion. So your responses to the presentations of the three speakers. Go ahead, Doctor. Yes. Uh, hello. So good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I agree with uh, all the speakers, especially uh, my colleague here, uh, Sir Paul, uh, on the lessons learned. So the cancer control plan should be uh, uh, have should have these four characteristics. Number one, whole of government. So the Department of Health cannot do it alone. Other government agencies should also be on board, and uh, not just the national government, but also the local government. 
especially in the Philippines, our uh, health system is devolved. And number two, whole of society. That was uh, discussed uh, by uh, Ms. Uh, Leslie. Okay? So uh, it's a, the public-private partnership is very important with regards to whole of society. And number three, it should be whole of system. So that was uh, partly discussed by uh, uh, Dr. Stevens. It should be comprehensive. It should uh, be uh, the entire continuum of cancer control from uh, prevention up to survivorship. And uh, lastly, it should be uh, life course. So the life course approach, as they say, from pregnancy to elderly, from uh, childhood to adolescence to adulthood, including pregnancy, until elderly. So that should be the, the cancer control plan. And there must be resources, as I discussed uh, earlier. There has to be resources, and it should be mobilized and maximized. Because if we're not going to be uh, using the resources, the plan will not be uh, effective. I mean, it, should not, it, should, uh, it is good only in paper. We need to do something about it. And uh, the leadership is really crucial. Okay? The, the champion at the Department of Health should be a decision maker. For your information, the implementer of the cancer law is the Department of Health, the lead implementer. So the higher up, the decision maker should be a champion of cancer. So that's a uh, part of our learnings. Uh, my uh, position at the Department of Health is just a technical staff. I cannot do something about it to, to implement the, the cancer law to the letter and uh, to its intent because uh, we have this limited, uh, uh, what you called it, limited, uh, with regards to the implementation, limited mandate. So I think uh, we learned a lot from the, the speakers, from the brilliant speakers that this uh, day, and we hope to apply them to our cancer control program. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cairo. So l let me ask uh, some questions to our speakers, and uh, let me start off with you first, uh, Leslie. Um, you know, you highlighted the, the importance of uh, partnership, uh, that, pe that governments, institutions don't go at it alone, and, and it's important that there is multi-sectoral partnerships. And there is a, there's a problem here very often that we see in, in uh, the different jurisdictions is that, as mentioned just now, it's often government-led. And when it's government-led, it's dominated very often by the government. So how do you go about ensuring that there is meaningful, equitable participation in the development process in the formulation of these national cancer control plans? Because very often you find that it it's, may not necessarily have as much inclusivity, including having a patient's on board as you might like and would there be uh, and I'm just going to put you on the spot here Leslie is there one particular good example of uh, one that uh, a, a national cancer control plan that has involved as many different stakeholders and different kind of of people that you would want to, to involve is, is there a good example of that go ahead yeah, sure. Um, well, I would say there's not one simple solution to your question. I mean, I, I think that it does take organizations like cancer societies and survivor groups to speak up and to um, go to the go to the government agencies and um, express their willingness to be involved. I think that it also takes organizations like the International Cancer Control Partnership and WHO and others who can influence it, governments as they develop these types of plans to include um, other stakeholders besides just government stakeholders. So I think it's somewhere in the middle we can all meet and uh, hopefully bring others to the table to answer the question about uh, countries that we've seen do a good job of this. There are many. Um, I'm very familiar with a lot of the Pacific Island jurisdictions. Um, in my work here in the US, I don't know if anyone is there from Guam, but they have had an excellent um, process for many years now involving all types of different partners uh, across the, the whole spectrum. 
not just government and also I would say other others in Malaysia. Um, there are a lot of African countries who have done very well in this in this endeavors. Uh, Uganda, Nigeria, um, Cameroon. I mean, there are just so many different countries who really do have broad partners who have come to the table, not only to develop the plan, but also have stayed with them to implement the plan. And their voice is just as important as the voice of government. Thank you, Leslie. And Lisa, um, you know, IEA being a UN agency, we're not strangers to uh, top-down policy instruments. And, and one of the things I see very often uh, when we're developing these strategic plans is a fundamental pitfall, which is that we put together these very nice instruments and then we don't cost them. We have no costing to what we have put together. We sometimes even forget to put in an action plan. So you have a very nice aspirational document, a very nice policy framework, and then there's no action plan, which is time bound, maybe five years, you know, 10 years, where you want to be, what do you want to see? And it's not costed. And because it's not costed, it's not necessarily adequately funded. And so there are quite a lot of pitfalls in terms of not so much ensuring success of cancer control plans, but actually making it likely that it will not be able to achieve what it set out to be when it was first formulated. So any tips there, Les, uh, Lisa, on your end on how do we avoid this particular tricky pitfall? Sure. So there's there's both the um, the implementation plan that you mentioned and through the partnership that, that Leslie highlighted, the International Cancer Control Partnership, there's actually um, an ECHO program looking to help countries that have imp that have developed a national cancer control plan and want to move to implementation because that's the next step. Um, it, sh it should be thought of at the time of planning, but sometimes it's not. And within that implementation plan, as you rightly mentioned, is the opportunity to cost it. And when we did a global review of national cancer control plans in 2018, we looked at were there um, were these plans costed and very few of them are and so there's the costing and then there's the setting aside of resources so who is actually developing a costing tool for cancer plans that can be um, uh, looked at in conjunction with developing the plan and developing the implementation plan but you're absolutely right because then you can take that costed plan and begin to mobilize internal government resources or external resources in order to fund the implementation. So it's it's a really key aspect that um, folks are not thinking of. And I heard Paul mention, I mean, he specifically talked about the financing and and as advocates, how do you what do you need to learn? And I think there's learning has to occur on all sides. But he mentioned specifically budget and financing. So I think that's um that's an important uh, point to highlight. Thank you, Lisa. And this is going back to that point that, that Paul mentioned just now in, in terms of the involvement of patients, caregivers, uh, different society organizations in order for there to be not just in terms of ensuring that they're included, but their needs are, and it's reflected in the dedication and commitment resources, but also uh, in the development of these cancer control plans. And in the Philippines, you're very fortunate to have a very strong civil society movement, uh, you know, after decades of, of being able to grow that. And it's not so strong in other countries, other jurisdictions, which may not have the ability to participate on the same level. So how do you go about building capacity of civil society so that when you talk about whole of society, you're able to have meaningful participation and you avoid the problem of tokenism, where you can just tick the box and say, well, we had patients at the meeting, they were involved, but actually not having a voice. So how do we go about uh, ensuring that not only are they at the table, but they're able to participate in the discussions that follow in the development of these cancer control plans? Well, there are a number of initiatives that have been done on, um, as an offshoot of uh, UHC and NICA. And one of is to really discipline and educate our ranks. Uh, and I think uh, I Can Serve Foundation, for example, would conduct series of uh, sessions to really um, teach or really empower uh, the different um, cancer groups. Uh, 
fighting for any cause. The second aspect that we did is we kind of like did some sort of tasking, um, meaning to say, so this is a territory that you're very familiar with, and so you have to take the lead and champion this. Um, given that the coalition that I represent actually involves the medical societies as well. So we, when we were developing, obviously, the different uh, um, um, uh, protocols, for example, for each cancer, they were part of the lead, and they just keep on feeding it back uh, to the organization in terms of how we could further uh, improve on these things. So it's a work in progress, if I may say so. Uh, but I think uh, that constant communication and, and, and at the same time, that whole idea of just opening up to all the possibilities in terms of learning um, is the one that really are, uh, is helping us all, all along. Um, admittedly, uh, the Philippines is also part of a, um, a very much of a signatory of a different uh, international uh, um, agreements. And we keep on monitoring that. Um, so in, and we use that, actually, uh, to leverage when we start talking to the Department of Health, uh, um, to remind them that uh, the country is one of the very first signatories of this particular uh, cancer control um, policies and all that. As such, you, know, you have to fall in line and let's, let's adhere and, and conform to these things. So all this awareness is actually has to be put into action. And um, a, lot of, a lot of it is really based on uh, some sort of tasking by identifying key people who would actually take the lead. Thank you, uh, Paul. And, and this is where I think we're coming to the end of the session, but I really want to be able to, to ensure that, you know, th those who are participating in the session today who may feel a bit jaded or cynical with regards to these policy instruments, and sometimes we've seen it, we've seen it all, we've seen the best kind of, of documents and strategic plans, and yet we don't see enough commitment that goes back to it. And, and one of the reasons is, is definitely that, you know, is that we don't have enough eyeballs uh, onto the commitments, the resources that need to be dedicated, and also monitoring and, and, and evaluation in terms of the implementation. It's very often falling flat there. It, it doesn't uh, uh, deliver what it sets itself out to, go, uh, to do. So uh, we're coming to the end, and I really want to be able to end the session with maybe 30 seconds from each of, of our speakers here on their thoughts of what would you like uh, those listening into the session to take away from? Just one thing, not a laundry list, please. Just one thing, 30 seconds. So I'll start off with the Philippines first, uh, Paul, and uh, you go ahead. Well, I, I think the message is the fight never ends. Um, and yes, I hear you about being jaded. Uh, we went through the same thing. Uh, but I think if we just have to remind ourselves that, you know, um, there is still X number of patients dying every single day in, in, in our countries, then, you know, we should just put aside all the frustrations and put aside all, uh, you know, um, the other questions in your mind and just fight on and soldier on. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Cairo. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Thank you, uh, Paul. And I think it's very important at this particular time, which is budget season, yeah. and you're going to see budgets that are being formulated. We want to make sure that governments put money to their commitments as outlined in the Cancer Control Plan, and that needs to happen. So, Dr. Cairo? Yes, uh, you're right. So now that it's budget season, we need to implement the law. We need to uh, finance or fund the, the activities, the projects that will support the, the cancer law. And uh, that's uh, one uh, weakness that uh, we found out. The, the leadership and governance is not that uh, strong for the implementation of cancer law. That is why uh, we need to uh, uh, push more for the better implementation of the cancer law. Because uh, if we cannot fund it properly, then the cancer law is only good in paper. Thank you, Dr. Cairo. Uh, over to you, Lisa. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. I've really enjoyed this session. And what I would say is really what, what Paul talked about is, is get engaged. Uh, don't think someone else will do it, that's someone else's job. But um, the voices of the advocates are so important at all stages. So again, I highlighted some examples from the impact assessment from that initial um, activity, but there are opportunities to, to really engage in all steps of the process stay engaged and build that network. I, I couldn't agree with you more, Lisa. I mean, we need to stay engaged. We need to keep up our spirits. And most importantly, don't get disappointed. You know, don't give up and to stay the course. And certainly, uh, we now come to uh, Leslie. You started this all off, and I give you the last word there. Go ahead. 
Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me here. I appreciate being with you. I would say um, echo what Lisa and Paul um, have said, and also just to say, find out what's in your national cancer plan. Um, if you don't have one, talk to uh, your uh, NGOs and also your government, your Ministry of Health and um, ask them, why don't we have a cancer plan? Or if you have a policy that's not implemented, not funded, um, know that you do have a voice and that if you don't ask the question, perhaps no one else will. Um, and so it's, it's important to find out what's in your plan, to ask if you can be involved, to place yourself in a way so that you can be involved. I think it's your voice is really important. And I don't know that we talked a lot, a lot about breast cancer necessarily in this session, but hopefully the other thing to leave you with is that there are opportunities for breast cancer advocates across the whole continuum, not just in early detection. But um, when you come to the table, you might have to work on other things besides breast cancer screening or early diagnosis. and. We know that the treatment aspects and um, survivorship aspects are just as important. So your voice is important there too. Thank you, Leslie. And that was an excellent way to end the session by emphasizing on your voice, not just patients, caregivers, but also the governments, the different stakeholders, partners. Your voice is import important and for us to continue to be speaking out at the table. So we end the session uh, on National Cancer Control Plan. And uh, I would like to thank you all for your attention. And uh, I would like to just remind that we have just a few more to go. And then we end at the uh, symposium for the past three days. So I'm Azroma Khalib uh, from Manila, the Philippines, uh, signing off. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>